Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Run After Dark, or possibly Before Dark, if you're listening to this as a version of the Supporters Club Friday 15 podcast, if that's the case. Thank you, we love you. For everyone tuning in live, we love you too, because you're spending your Friday nights with us, so we appreciate that. We are here to talk about the Boston University Terrier Classic, which took place, the first day was tonight, the men's 5Ks, and... The fastest time of the night was not someone I don't think any of us expected. It was Adrian Wildscott of Hoka NAZ Elite and South Africa, the first South African man ever under 13 minutes. He wins the white heat of the 5,000 in 1256-76. Nico Young right behind him. History, 1257.14. First collegiate ever under 13 minutes. Breaks the collegiate record of Graham Blanks that stood for less than two months. He's also the youngest American ever under 13 minutes. Huge run for him, just 21 years old. So he would, I would say, is the headline performance because the first heat, which was the Scarlet Heat containing Yard Nagus and the members of the On Athletics Club, that was won by Edwin Kurgai, another guy I don't think we really saw coming. He is a former NCAA cross-country champion. He now trains with the Under Armour Dark Sky Distance Group out in Flagstaff. And it wasn't Yard Goose or Joe Klecker battling it out at the end of this one or, or Jordy Beamish. It was Edwin Kurgai and George Mills went one to George Mills, the British miler, third in the Diamond League final last year in the 1500. He was second in 1258. Yard Goose, who had the lead, with 400 meters to go, he was third, 1302.09. Big PB Olympic standard for him, but I don't think he wants to run the 5K again anytime soon. In all, we had five men under 13. We had 11 hit the Olympic standard. That includes Wildscott, who already had the Olympic standard. So a bunch of things to break down. There were some surprises, I would say, in terms of who ran fast, also who did not run so fast. Woody Kincaid, who set the American record of 1251 at this meet last year. He was a non-factor in the second heat. He only ran 13-15. So not a great night for him, but we're here to break it all down. Uh, this is myself, Jonathan Galt. I am joined by Weldon Johnson, my co-host, co-founder of Let'sRun.com. Robert Johnson, you're not going to believe this, guys. We're having some technical difficulties. So he may join in the middle of the show. But Weldon, what is your, what's your immediate reaction from the night's action? Ooh, I can't go negative, John. My immediate reaction, Nico Young. Nico Young, the first collision under 13 minutes. That's cool. I mean, no offense to Edwin Kur Kurgat, Edwin Kurgat or Adrian Wolscott, but from an American perspective, for, for sure, I mean, this kid like dominated the high school ranks, missed his senior year because of COVID. He's had pretty good success in the collegiate ranks, but – now he's your collegiate record holder, which is great. I mean, it's, it's come a long way, but some of my, my other takeaways are like, wow, like this track is fast, man. And if you run 1256 here in January, does that mean anything later in the year? Well, this is the question, right? Because I talked to – Will Scott after the race, and he was very pleased with it because he said, you know, if you followed his NCAA career, he was the NCAA runner-up in cross country back in 2020. You know, he has had some big time performances, but his problem, I think, was the same problem that Nico Young has been criticized for: is his closing speed just isn't quite there. He doesn't have a big kick, and he said that's something he's really been trying to work on. Uh, in his professional career, he was very happy with how it turned out tonight because he he had the best closing speed in this field. He went 57-43 for his last 400, which, you know, that isn't going to win you a Diamond League race, but 57-43 in a 12-56 race is good. And 27-20 for his last 200, which he was very pleased with. So that was basically his thinking was, you know, I'm making progress. But I didn't ask him this, and maybe I should have Weldon. But I'm like, okay, it's good that your speed is like on point in January, but you really want your speed to be on point in like 
June, July, August. So the positive spin would be, hey, he's made some gains and he can make even further gains. The negative spin would be like, wait, did he just mistime things here? You know, but he was taking the positives out of this one. John, you can't go negative. He won this race. He beat yeah, Phelps. Yeah. He never, never no. has beaten before. So huge win. NA is the elite. If we have a new coach this year, like things started out as well as they could for them. Edwin Kerr got, he was celebrating. Like he's sure he's an NCAA cross country champion, but name one thing to me that he said on the track as a professional. Oh, I was going to name that he won 2022 cross champs uh, in Austin last year, but on the track, Edwin Kerr got, I, I couldn't tell you anything. So. I mean, if if you draw it up, you're the you know NAZ elite. You're Adrian, you're Edwin, A plus, A plus plus plus. But my only thing is like, do I expect these guys to be world beaters at the end of the year? Now maybe they were going up a, a level in class, but if we look back at this meet from last year, everybody flipped out, right? Woody Kincaid runs twelve fifty one, and how did Woody Kincaid do at the five k at Worlds, John? He did not run that race well, and he didn't qualify for the team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was my. I did. Sometimes, John, you know, I, I don't. Um, I, we ask you. I ask you so, because I don't know the answer. It's called that trust. One, well, then we've got it. Um, but that, look, flip side, guy called Yard Nagus at this meet last year ran an American record of seven twenty eight, and at that time, were we all saying, "Oh, Yard Nagus, he's going to be one of the best milers in the world this year." No, not not yet. We won. Then he went to Milrose and ran three forty seven and closed like a bat out of hell. And they're like, okay, this guy's for real. But breakthroughs can can and do happen at this race, as we saw with Yared last year. Yeah, if you gun to my head, do I think Weldskit and uh, Edwin Kogar are going to be, you know, contending for an Olympic medal this year? No, but that that's also because the competition level in this event is very high. Like I think this was breakthrough performance for both of them wildscape was already pretty good last year um you know 1302 he already had the olympic stand he kind of had no pressure I i've been pretty impressed with him but he you know he also was 14th at worlds in the 10,000. so that's kind of around where the americans were uh Klecker, kincaid that sort of range yeah a great run for him but do it do i think this vaulted him into you know top five six in the world either of them no not yet and that that's okay that's it's hard to be that good yeah for sure uh maybe we should like go through these races sort of one by one we also have a mile we got to talk about colin solomon with a big win 353 huge but. huge day for newbury park high school alums well then who are currently on the northern arizona university team yeah, for sure. Sean Brosnan Bos was in attendance, John. Did you see him there? I did see him, yeah. Hard to miss. Hard to miss, John. Well, he's just like an another human being. Like, well, he has a distinctive, big... slick, stick, spiky hairstyle. I mean, you know, there are some people that are hard to miss. They have a cat pulled down low or something like that. Sean Brosnan's not one of those people. But let's maybe go through these races the two five case first, because also, and John, we'll talk through the races a bit because we can assume, especially people, we know a lot of, some people are watching this live, but this is designed. Well, it's designed to be live as well, but it's also a supporters club podcast. If you want the latest in track and field from let's run.com, you need to be a supporters club member. Join today. Let's run.com slash subscribe. We'll get this as a podcast. You will get, you get a, bonus second podcast every week from us use code sc25 to save 25 percent. do it today but all right heat number one i'm gonna call this the well uh, they, they were calling these like the red and white like, it's probably just easier to call it the first heat but this one officially was the scarlet heat i'm gonna call it the oac heat john is that a fair okay assessment? that's fine that, that's fine because they say they're doing even heats, but all the OAC guys are in this heat. So clearly the coaches had influence of who, who went into certain heats. Yeah, I talked to Dave and Ritzenhain afterwards. I said, how did it shake out this way? He's like, I had one request, request, sorry, request that all my guys were in the same heat. He's like, I don't care who they put in there. Otherwise, I just wanted them all to be in the same heat so we could sort of control things. And 
the reason they split this up is because there are a lot of guys who wanted to try to run the Olympic standard and the meet organizer, um, Jordan Carpenter is the guy at BU who's in control of this thought, look, the fairest way for everyone to do this is we have two heats, each of them targeting 1305. And the, by doing that, you're not, you know, you're not crowding the track as, as much. Uh, that was their thinking at least was it, it would, make it it would give everyone a better shot at hitting the standard that's the ostensible reason makes sense but also when they do that john oh, take the results off here when they do that this isn't a race bu is essentially a time trial we're seeing that world athletics they came up with these new standards new system, point system, reward racing. And what do people go out and do? They now go out and time trial more and more often in the longer distances. It's it sort of had this perverse effect, but we don't, that's not the sort of discussion here. So the rabbits were supposed to go, I think 751 for 3K, which. That's right on the Olympic standard of 1305 pace. Okay. Because I, I was thinking off of that. I'm like, I didn't pull with the calculator, but I'm like, I think they're going to break 13 and both heats went under 13. And I think the days of this meet ever going over 13 minutes are gone. Like this is the new standard that we're at. Wait a minute. Um, well, I got second at this meet in 2013. I ran 1425. You don't think I can come up and get second with the 1425 again? Second overall. I mean, it, it was a weak year, but yeah, second overall. Like the first heat. Yes, that's what second overall means. Wow, John, congratulations! You, you, you were. Right, let me see here. Let me pull up, pull up these results. But heat one here is probably a better way to look at it. Wow, Yard Nagus, third place. Jonathan Galt, second place in this meet. Congratulations! But I mean, is that once the rabbits the yard? These are two quote unquote even heats, well, so that makes me even more impressive. But yeah, we had three guys under thirteen in this race. Car got like. Essentially, the OAC, we had a good pacemaker, AJ Ernst, who was the pacemaker for a number of these races last year at BU that produced records. He takes them through 3K. That's kind of on the OAC guys. George George Mills, those, he moves up. He had told me afterwards, you know, he kind of was like, hey, I'm okay pushing the pace, trying to help you guys out here. And he was thinking that Klecker and Deguse might be able to help him a little bit as well. I don't think Klecker really ended up having it. So Mills kind of made sure he, he pushed it on. And then Nagoose takes over. And I'm like, all right, ball game over. I've seen this movie before. Yard Nagoose takes the lead with, you know, 800 meters to go. He's just going to run away from everyone. Didn't happen. He took the lead, but Mills and Kurgot did not get dropped. They, those three had separated from everyone else. And 400 to go. Kurgot moves by and looks good. And Nagoose gets dropped. Mills comes in the second. It's Kurgot, Mills, and Nagoose, one, two, three, in that order, with Nagoose a fair amount back in third. Yeah, it was a bit surprising. I mean, credit to George Mills, because he was pushing it. And then, like, as you said, John, once Nagoose went to the front, I'm like, is he going to win this? But I don't know. He didn't look amazingly great. I, coming in, I did not expect him to break 13 minutes. He didn't. You guys were so bullish on this, like the world record. I don't know. I just, for his first 5K as a pro, this is a pretty damn good run. But his last, you know, he slowed down. He must have been leading until. It was about 3 you know, 50 when Kogot took the lead. Yeah, 600 to go. He actually ran, I think, his fastest lap of the day. Um, I mean, this is crazy, John. They're actually with like a mile to go. They're running 29, 29, 6. He runs 29, 61 with 600 to go and was leading at that point, gets past it. And, and that was it for him 30.9, 31.3, and 31.0. So you can't really say he fell apart at the end. No, um, he was he was fairly realistic about it. He's like, I think I'm in actually better shape you know, for the mile right now than I was at this time last year. But the 5K, that's an extra 2,000 kilometer, 2,000 meters compared to what he ran at this meet last year. He ran the 3K. He's like, I just wasn't quite ready for that. And he's like, I don't like this event. The, you know, the last few laps, I was feeling it. I was like, when's the last time you hurt that bad? And he was like, 
NCAA cross 2021 when he was like 158th. That's, you know, he's like, that's the last time I felt that bad uh, at the end of a race. So not the day he wanted it, I don't think, like in terms of, but it was, well, it was also like, I think people were filling his head with like, hey, you should be able to run like low 1250s or mid 1250s. And he was like, eh, I'm not sure, guys. And he kind of did that last year and he'd always run what everyone thought he was going to run or even faster. And this time he was like, eh, I'm not sure. And actually he did run on the slower side, but it, I'm not worried about this performance by Nagus at all. He, he's not a 5k runner that this race showed it, but he's not going to be running the 5k this summer. I mean, we should probably actually be praising Nagus big picture. Cause I did not expect him to do oh, We're joined by Robert Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, he gave me a look. But I, I told you, I didn't expect him to break 13 minutes. He came close to it. But what's his probably his real goal for the indoor season? To well, break the, was, baby. In, break the world record at Milrose in two weeks. That's two. I think it's two weeks, right? Two or weeks no, from Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Olympic trials next week and then Milrose. So pretty good. And then the other thing related to this is – George Mills, John, he was fifth in the Diamond League 1500. Like, did he no, even he's run third. Worlds? Like, uh, he was third in the Diamond League final. And he he was also very – I asked him about that. I'm like, do you think you went up a level? He's like, no, let's be realist, realistic, man. I didn't make the Worlds team in the 1500 for Great Britain. So while these guys were all killing themselves in Budapest, I was just kind of able to train. He felt like that kind of gave him an advantage going into the Diamond League final. But he's a very, very good 1500 runner. And I was like, what was the thinking behind this? He's like, well, you know, they do a lot of double threshold training. He's very strength oriented. So he knew he was in good shape. He's like, get the 5K standard. His focus is still on the 1500, but I think he'd like to do both this year. And it's a very, it's a, it's a fullback option. You know, if he doesn't make the British 1500 team, which is very competitive, there aren't going to be many Brits with the 5K standard and he has it. So that puts him at least as a for a backup if he doesn't make the 1500 team for great britain he's in a good spot in the 5k i mean the british 1500 meter team we got a comment here in the chat from bravo rojo rojo it says with george mills running this fast if he's back down the 1500 this summer it's going to take 329 to make the uk olympic team you're going to have to be that type of runner agreed because you have jake whiteman josh kerr george mills you also have the guy, um, John. You're half British, like, like you've got Neil Gawley, who was a world championship finalist last year, and you've got Elliot Giles, who's like, I mean, you've, there are a bunch of guys. There's going to be another guy who's going to pop off and run three foot thirty one. Like there are three thirty one, three thirty two guys growing on trees in the UK right now. I mean, it's crazy, but we are now joined by the one and only. Robert Johnson. What were you Sorry, about? guys. Not sure why Bill Gates decided it was time to update my computer. But it was. And here I am. I don't know what you've been saying, but uh, Weldon says, right when I get on, I, I shook my head. He said, there's no reason for Nagus to be disappointed. Well, I'm assuming you haven't played in the audio. Can I share this audio with you? Jonathan Galt interviewing you in the Goose. Club podcast this weekend. Ollie Hoare kind of threw out that you and Dathan may have discussed the world record in this race. Is that true? No, he was like, you can run like low 1250s, which like could insinuate the world record, but I think he just meant more like sub 1255 in a sense. Yeah. Which I felt like it was also reasonable. Um, but yeah, I think. I think, I mean, I think that race went out a little slower than it was supposed to. I couldn't really tell. But I think also just like, you know, I wasn't quite as, I don't know, feeling quite as fast as I would have liked to really go for it. So, yeah. yeah. Where yeah. do you feel like you're, you're at training-wise right now compared to this time last year? I feel like I'm still like in really, probably a little bit better than I was last year. Um, I feel like even though like the race might not have shown that. I feel like All right, Robert, I might have missed on – stood in man because i thought he said sub 1255 was unreasonable but it actually sounds like he thought it was reasonable so um i he he didn't seem too bummed honestly he was like the 5k is hard and that's not my event that was my main takeaway from our conversation no i just i thought it was interesting because 
to, to be honest, I, I didn't watch these races live. We only pay for one full track account. Let Weldon have it. My son wanted to make a fire, even though it's now 70 degrees here in Baltimore. So I was doing that, and I was just looking at the results, and I was like, wow, it's kind of underwhelming. I was really pumped for Nico Young. I'm like, kind of underwhelming for the OAC. I love the threads, like OAC cooked. What's wrong with the OAC? But I, I, I was just kind of like, well, 1303 is kind of what I thought it for Nagus, but also a world record wouldn't have stopped me. So I'm like, what did he think of it? So I, I went to the source, the, the the best interviewer in the country, Jonathan Gold's YouTube. I mean, let's run YouTube, Jonathan Gold on there. And I, I thought that was good. So it acknowledged that Ritz thought what we thought. This guy might just be able to run well 1250s first time out. And he thought that. And at one point in the interview, he said, I felt good at one point. I made a big move, and then I, I didn't feel good. So that's interesting. But – yeah, big thing, big picture wise. I, I think it's not what I mean. Last year, every race he did basically he blew us away, right? Except for Worlds in the 1500 final, 728 American record, which is stunning what he did. This year, nothing's going to stun us. There's there's higher expectations, but I thought big picture wise, the fact that he, that a he got the standard and he's like, I don't want to run that again. But I think it's kind of important. What if he falls in the Olympic trials in the 1500? Do Rerun the race, the, the Rojo oh, request. Oh my God. They should. They would, right? Finally. Please fall on purpose. It, by the way. But anyways. If you fall um, on purpose, they're not going to rerun the race. No, no. It needs to be like it needs to be Nagus and Cole Hawker and like Kessler and Central. For, for those of you that are like. that aren't not longtime listeners of the show, it's in the rule book. If someone falls, you can rerun the race. I've never seen it in my life, but before I die, I'd like to see it happen. So it's an inside joke and let's run. But the part where he says, I think I'm ahead of last year is exciting right i mean i always say when you have a massive year people just think it's going to keep improving and normally everything went right it's hard to i, I would say honestly like more more often times than not you have a massive year you're kind of below it the next year just a little bit and then maybe you go up in the years to come kind of like hobbs kessler the breakout year then a little bit worse then good again but this is saying you know we'll find out soon in melrose like whether he really is ahead and can we no. praise this guy for wanting to go to world indoors? Like he laid out exactly what you want to hear. I said, why do you want to do it? He's like, well, it's a world indoors. And I think it would be good for me. I can go there and win a medal. It's like, that's, and then he's like, I don't think it's too much to us to run this and then take some downtime and get in and peak again, you know, later in the summer, which I'm like, oh, wow. It, it is. It does seem uh, like I, it's possible. People. I think it's it almost, as, John, it, it's almost disgusting that we have to ask the question mm -hmm. and that we're like shocked that, that they want to do it. But to me, like Nagus, like, I mean, I know he's got the NCA experience that Alan Webb never had, which is good tactical experience. But just the more race tactics, I think he – I mean, what what happened to Worlds? We don't know. Was it tactics? Was he off his game? I just think he doesn't have a lot of international experience, you know. So I, I think indoors is wonderful for him just from a tactical standpoint. So I'm glad he wants to do it. Have you guys shared any Nico Young clips because – or or talked about his buildup? Because that's done me. No, we haven't. Let's let's talk about Nico now. He was. I mean, he didn't win Wait, the anyone, second. Heat. Anyone else, John, in this first heat we want to talk about? Like, let's let's wrap up the first heat. Oh, okay. Well, I look. I think George, Jordy Beamish, thirteen oh four. That's a good race for him. I mean, we know the he was fifth at Worlds in the steeple last year. That's going to be his event. But that's a PB. I don't think you can find that much to complain about if you're him. Ben Flanagan, huge for him to get the Olympic standard, 13.04. I talked to him after the race. I'm like, does this mean you're on the team, basically? Because, you know, he's Canadian. Like, who else from Canada is going to get that standard? Mohamed, probably, and maybe Justin Knight if he gets back to running. And even then, that's, I don't, you know, T, I'm not sure about that. So Flanagan has missed the Olympics. You know, he missed it in 2021. He was close. He was very excited. So big run for him. Klecker, I mean, missing the standard, that's what he came out here to do and he didn't get it. you got to be disappointed with that, even if 1306 isn't exactly, like, slow. And Morgan McDonald, who's had, like, injury hell the last few years, 1307, I think that's a PB for him. I know he didn't get the standard, but it's hard to be that disappointed when, you know, you're, run you're finally running a PB again after all these years of frustration and injuries. The standard is... 13 1305 flat. Oh, five flat. I was like, wow, Clecker missed it by 0.02, but it's no one point second oh two. Yeah. 
I mean, he's got to be one of the more disappointed guys, especially after last year coming in here. But I mean, he's a 5K guy and he gets beat by two guys in his own training group who aren't 5K runners. Jordy Beamish, man, look out in that steeplechase because what's the knock on Jordy Beamish? Well, it's that he sometimes, he has a tendency to fall asleep in the middle of races and get dropped. Yeah. Um, well, actually, let me, let me look at his splits. I wonder what he closed in here. But yeah, I thought, you know, big picture. I, he is somebody who could do something in the steeplechase. You know, guys, of these guys, who do I think will be a factor at, at, at Worlds in the 5,000? So I'm not sure about any of these guys. I mean, maybe George, sure George of these guys, maybe George Mills, because he's got that mile speed. He he could be uh, if he ends up running it. He's probably. Got, I mean, Nagus, I don't think is going to run it, so I, I don't think you have to concern yourself with that. But yeah, Jordy Jordy Beamish, I would say there's a difference between sort of falling asleep and getting dropped at a pace that you can handle and you're just not committing to it, versus a really fast pace. Like, could he have run hung with these guys and run 1257 or 1258? That's pretty aggressive. Like to me, 1304 is pretty close to the, from an outside perspective. I think he did a good job of running a pace he could handle. He was, I think he was up at the front of that chase pack for some of it. So I, I think he ran a good race. Yeah. No, I thought he did better than usual. What? And he did, he did have the finest, the fastest final lap. He actually, him and Ben Flanagan are right next to each other on the, on the final lap, and they both just blew it out, 27-point final lap. So congrats to them. Um, and, and they needed that, actually, too, John, because they, they got the thing yeah. by, by 0.67, and Flanagan got it by 0.38. So, <laughs> I mean, you, usually, like, oh, you really need to kick to get the standard? It doesn't happen, but they both did it. I mean, like they Ben Flanagan – it was cool. He had, I mean, the atmosphere for these races, I will say, was great. I wasn't sure what it was going to be like, especially because they weren't, you know, approaching the American records that we got last year. But the atmosphere was really good. The crowd got into it, especially, I think, the second heat. Like, Nico Young. People just love Nico Young, man. But the, the first heat, Ben Flanagan, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but his wife is, like, the daughter of the guy who runs the Falmouth Road Race. So... He had like a big cheering section and he went over there and was whooping it up with them because, you know, he got under the Olympic stand by four tenths of a second. So they were going nuts. It was it was a really cool. Uh, it was cool. Uh, good atmosphere. All right. Let me say a few other things here. Kita Sato. When I first saw this name in like ninth place, 13 or nine, I was like, is it? really necessary for someone to fly all the way across from Japan to run an indoor 5,000. Like not that I am overly concerned about the environment, but and then I thought about it. I'm like, well, he can't actually run with anyone in Japan. Like 1309 is this guy turned 20 on January 22nd. So that's number two all time in Japanese history. 130840 is, is, is Suguro Osaka's national record. So congrats to him at age 20. He, he's very good for, for Japan. That was kind of cool. But has anyone talked about the race winner, Edwin Kurgat? Like, I was like, wasn't this like the second best Iowa State guy? Like, wasn't he in Wesley Kiptu's shadow? No, and then, he, was an, he was an NCAA champion before Kiptu got to campus. My, I mean, my theory on him is simple, uh, Robert. This is a guy, he's been in Iowa at sea level the last four years until about the middle of 2023 when he moves to Flagstaff and starts training with Stephen Haas's Dark Sky Distance Group. Again, we say this all the time. Altitude, it's legal doping, people. You can just go there and get better at running if you're a responder. This is a guy, he's born and raised in Kenya, been in the States for a while now. But to me, you know, I think they've, Stephen Haas is a good coach, but it's just such a boost to go from training in Iowa to training in Flagstaff. That's got to help, right? He was the NCAA champion, but in my mind, I was like, didn't Kiptu seem better? Maybe I was in the fog of war of having a, a, a toddler at the time in 2019. Because if you look up the NCAA results from 2019, I mean, if, if, I'm sure John's got a photographic memory. Joe Klecka, so, second, right? Yeah, I was going to say, who's Conor second? Conor third. Yep. Now, fourth place, I think, was the Virginia Tech guy, Peter Soifer. 
Jesus Christ, John. And then fifth, I off the top of my head, I cannot remember who was fifth place. Sorry. Uh, SEC school, John. Was it one of the Arkansas guys? No, Vincent Kiprop of Alabama. Uh, and then okay. Cooper All Tier. Right. So he beat some really, you know, some studs. I mean, you know, beat some good guys. But um, great race for him. But congratulations. All right. I Wait, think so we need to talk about Nico Young. We're half an hour into the show. One heat? Well, we, we talked about Nico Young a little bit at the top, but yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, we were talking about Nagoose. Uh, yeah, let, let's get to the second heat now. Again, the winner, Adrian Wilskut uh, of NAZ Elite. We did talk about him a little in the intro. Really great run. But the story here from a U.S. perspective is Nico Young. Guys, he is more than three years younger than Grant Fisher was when he broke 13 minutes in 2022. Previously, Grant Fisher was the youngest American to do it. Nico Young is now the youngest by more than three years. 21 years old, 1257-14. And Robert, I'm not sure if you have a clip queued up from the interview, but there are a couple things he said about this that were interesting. One is that... You know, he kind of he's reached a new level this indoor season. And actually, it was interesting. I like was talking to Mike Smith before the race and was saying like, he was like, "Man, I, I saw he ran that fast at BU." And it's not like he had a bad NCAA cross meet, but when he saw him run that 3K at BU and now the workouts he's been doing now, he's like, "Oh, did I miss time the peak a little bit with this guy for NCAA cross?" But whatever it is, he's in amazing shape now. But the other thing is, he has been kind of banged up the last couple of weeks. Like he said, he wasn't running. Yeah, well, here's, well, here's the well, clip. Yeah, um, I mean, this was kind of a weird buildup just because like, um, like I ran a good mile and I had pretty good training over winter, but kind of had the past two weeks, I've kind of like barely ran with some like knee pain, but like, I don't know if I should even be saying that. I don't really care, but uh, but honestly, I was able to kind of show myself that it doesn't really matter how much I run. I can still run fast, so happy, happy about that. What yeah. do you mean by barely ran? Like, how many days lost two weeks have you been running? Um, well, I ran every day, pretty much, but it was, like, just very short, like a couple miles and stuff. Really just, like, the races, like the mile kind of got me ready for this. The Friday before the mile, I ran a good workout. It's, like, on YouTube. I'm sure people have seen that. That's what I did, so... I knew I was ready. Basically. I can't believe he's banged up, John, because he's been lighting it up on all cylinders this indoor season. Yeah, he ran this incredible workout. I mean, he ran the 737 where he was out kicking some good guys in December, and then he had that 357 mile at 7,000 feet last week in Flagstaff. I mean, when he ran that, I'm like, it's Robert called it in the week that was. He said collegiate record and probably sub-13 because if you're running 357 at altitude and you're not a miler, you're going to be you got to be fit as hell. And he was. He smashed Graham Blank's collegiate record. And Robert is the one who, I mean, it's not the only one who called it, but you might have been one of the first. You're muted, Robert. Confession here. I guess I'll be honest since it went well. Not sure that I came up with that idea. Well, and I were fortunate enough to be at the same birthday party last weekend. Is Sean Brosnan, Nico Young's high school coach. And I was like, man, that mile was impressive. And he kind of said, it's up 13. And I said, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, once, once he sort of raised it to me, I was like, oh, yeah, that's going to happen. So we got yeah, Weldon, I think- Weldon, I got a text right after the race. Like, told you he could do it. I'm like, yeah, man, you nailed it. Yeah, I yeah, think he was saying thing- he's like, I think I'm gonna fly to Boston for this thing, and I'm like, wow. Um, so if he hadn't told me that, I'd be even more impressed with Nico's run. That's the un- the thing that I'm doing unfair f- for him. Um, and it, I've all, but also talking to Sean a, a, a bit about his guys and stuff. I'm also, it's crazy to say that I appreciate the talent of Nico a little bit more now. But think about what he did. It's really hard to come in NCAs. He was immediately top 10 NCAs. He was, what, fourth the first year? Yeah, fourth as a true um, freshman. So that's really good. And then he's sort of been, like, knocking on the door the whole time. And so it, well, he didn't win this race. He hasn't won any NCAA, NCAA champion races, and that's 
sort of the knock about him, but to be the first collegian under 13 minutes and yeah, John, I'm sort of shocked by you, you said, you know, how much younger he is than the other, any other American. You know, he was the same high school class as Caitlin Tui, and I kind of view him uh, similarly to her. They came in both with very high expectations. He said, is this fresh? You know, this is a guy, people have been lining up to take selfies with him since he was a junior in high school. You know, he's been a big deal. He won an XN as a senior. He ran 756 as a senior. Then COVID happens, but he's always been very, very popular. And he said his freshman year at NAU, you know, there was a lot of pressure on him, a lot of attention. And he ran amazingly at NCAA cross, but he also had a couple of races where he wasn't quite as good. And he just said that was a little difficult, but he really credited his, his support team. He credited the NAU coach, Mike Smith for helping him sort of get through that. He thinks he's in a great place now. And yeah, it, it kind of was like, you know, if we said four years ago, Oh, Nico young, he's going to go and set a collegiate record. Uh, by his fourth year at NAU, it would have been like, well, that makes sense. This guy's one of the best high school runners ever. But to get to that point, it's not always just a straightforward trajectory. He's had a lot of good results, especially in cross country. But now to put it together on the track, it kind of reminds me what we saw from Caitlin Tui in the 2021-2022 season. She really came on strong that 2022 indoor season. She won her first NCAA title outdoors in 2022 and since then she you know continued to to be the best woman in college uh until you know parker valley most this most recent ncaa cross season the question for nico young he ran great in this race his kick certainly looks to have been improved from where it was at but there are a lot of good guys in the ncaa still graham blanks is really good kai robinson didn't run well tonight but we know how good his kick is Nico Young, it, it sounds crazy to say this, Weldon, but you can be a 1257 guy and you still might not win an NCAA title. That's how good the NCAA is right now. Yeah, put up a question here and then from the chat from David Sherratt. The question is, will Nico Young ever win an NCAA title? He's always right there, but just can't take the win, even today. He deserves it, just needs to find that p puzzle piece. It's true. I mean, the game has changed. I, I, I don't know, like... You know, 13 minutes, the old 13, 20. I mean, I, I don't think the shoes make that much of a difference, but with the increased training, more training kids do in high school, that sort of stuff. But it was interesting, the Caitlin Tui analogy you bring up, John, because Tui has won lots of NCAA titles. She's not, you know, now full-fledged pro. But with this run, like, whose progress do you rank further at this point? Like, I mean... They're both on the outside of looking in for the, for the U.S. Olympic team right now. The, I think if you still bet, will either one of them make the, the Olympic team? They're, neither one's a sure thing. I think you'd bet no on both both of them. Th that's the safer bet. There's three spots, yeah. though, but I, I think so. The women's side isn't nearly as well. I don't know. I mean, the top international women are so much better than the U.S. women. What, so, well, then. It's a good question because at the U.S. level, all right, Nico Young, what do you think, uh, 1257, what do you think that ranks on the all-time U.S. list, indoors and outdoors combined? I mean, it might be top 10. It's seventh. It's seventh. So, yeah, it's very high up. Now, Caitlin Tui, her personal best is 1503. Where do you think that ranks? I mean, it's like 45th or something. Yeah, it's 38th. So, like, in terms of absolute greatest performance that either of them have done, uh, I mean, Tui's got, and she's got multiple NCAA records. She has the multiple NCAA record in the mile. She has it in the 3000. But in terms of 5000 PB, Nico's is a lot higher. And to get to the top, to get to seventh on the women's list, she would have to run 1443. And we haven't seen that from her quite yet. So I do think that they're, they're closer than people think. If I had to say, who do I think is going to make an Olympic team this year? I mean, the, the dude just ran 12.57. He's got to be in the conversation. But at the same time, I wonder, I feel like the men's competition is a little deeper in that event. Like, is So 
I, I might give a slight edge to Tui still, uh, but I think it's going to be very tough for, for either of them because also, you know, 1503 and 1257, they're not what 1503 and 1257 were five years ago. Yeah. I mean, those are it's interesting stats. I mean, you know, it's weird because like Tui needs to improve about 10 or 15 seconds in the 5K. Nico's time is sort of in the ballpark where you need, need to be to make a team, but you probably actually need to be about 1250 BU shape to make a US team and you better be able to kick. What I'd like to know about the kick is, John, what was the final lap today? What was the final lap for Grand Blanks? Well, I'm, I'm going to guess. You had done, I wish you had been able to tell me that because I don't have that number offhand. I, I, Nico Young's last lap today was 58 seconds flat. Sorry, his last 400. His last 200 was 2776. So somebody look up Grand Blanks because I was wondering. I knew Nico was right around 58. And I was curious about that. Like Josh Romine on Twitter on X says, who wins over AK? Or AK? Spring 2023 Kai Robinson, fall 2023 Grand Blanks or winter Nico Young. Well, I don't really care about AK. I care about I, I don't care either. I'm talking about like 5K track, which is interesting to me. Yeah, so to me, it's like who wins over 5K track. Oh, Nico, and, Nico had a faster close, Robert. Nico, um, Graham's close was 28.34 for his last lap. So, again, Nico was 27.76. Though, if you add it together, 58 flat for his last 400. That was what Nico ran. Graham Blanks was 57.64 for his last 400. But in a slower race significantly slower race the seven second race so yeah i was asking that because i kind of thought graham wasn't that fast i thought it was like 57 58 and this is what this was so to close basically almost the same piece final faster final 200 um oh he's losing the race graham's winning it yeah that, that you know it's interesting when i think of them john it's weird i just can't get over the fact and i know that cross country just happened but Kai Robinson just destroyed these guys last year in Austin twice. Yeah. And it's like, how could he ever lose a college race? Now he's lost a lot of college races since then. But yeah, peak. I don't know. I mean, to be honest, let's let's talk about it. Like, I just think it would be hard for Kai to be much better than he was last spring. And I think Nico's made a step up. Graham's improved a lot, but Kai's not at altitude. How fast is he going to run? Charles Hicks has gone pro as training partner. No offense to Ricardo Santos, but I don't think he's as good of a coach as, as Mike Smith. So, um, Well, the good thing, Robert, is we won't have to wait that long because in a month and a half, everyone will be back in Boston for the NCAA Indoor Championships, and we'll get to see And it I did say at the time, after Grand Blanks is – 55 days, 50, 55 days ago, Grand Blanks set his collegiate record. I said, I thought Kai would probably win NCAA indoors because, A, he was dominant outdoors. And also, he would be getting ready for the Australian Olympic trials. So he needs to be ready to go in about two months, right? Yeah, April is when they hold, hold those. Also, Robert, I just want to point out, it's funny, you had a great week that was this week, and you listed about 20 names for the entries in the 5K, saying, like, here are all the boldface names. I'm sure I missed some big ones. Don't get offended. Just run faster so I notice you this year. And I went in and I'm like, there's a couple people you have to include in here that you, you skipped over for some reason. And I debated putting in Adrian Wildskit because he has run 1302. It's among the fastest PBs in the field. He's the only guy, one of the few guys in this race who actually had the Olympic standard coming in. And I'm like, ah. Nah, no, I'll, I'll leave him out because you left him out. I'm like, is, does he that guy? Does he move the needle? He never won NCAA's. Well, turns out he was the guy who ran faster than everyone tonight. So if you do one of these next year and you say just run faster, so I notice you, well, I, I think he certainly accomplished that. 
Jack Milani. Milani? Did I say it? Milani? I think Milani, yeah. The new Hoka and Isaiah coach. The coach of the week. I had to go, I had to look up his name. Now I will know it. Now I know it. Like, I mean, that, that good for him, right? Yeah. No, I asked Wilts good about this. I said, you know, what's it been like for you? Because he pointed out he turned pro in, you know, I think it was 2022. So 2023 was his first season. So he's adjusting to a new coach, Alan Culpepper. He said he got along well with Culpepper, but then Culpepper leaves and Mulaney comes in. And at first he admitted, he's like, you know, I kind of had my guard up. I wanted, I wasn't sure. We're still feeling each other out, but I think this race will go a long way towards building trust. Cause he's like, look, I wanted to improve my speed and I improved my speed and I got a PB out of this. So I think whatever they're doing, things seem to be working. I think uh, Wiltskut definitely has more trust in Jack Mullaney after this race tonight. Seriously, that's a massive race. I mean, they literally hired a no-name that no one had ever heard of. What, the assistant at Portland State? To no, be the Portland. head of a pro You know? And it's like, this is great for the Rojo coaching career. I mean, you can instantly be a no-name and all of a sudden be coaching some of the best guys in the world. It, if you get the right breaks, but to me, disappointing. If we're looking at these results, Abdi Nur, you know, I mean, I'm expecting this guy to battle for a medal at, at Worlds. It doesn't matter though what kind of shape you're in January 26th. I guess he got the standard, so that's all that he needs. So, you know, it's like as a fan, you want to see him do better, but like, I mean, Woody Kincaid ran 1251 at this meet last year and didn't sniff a medal in the summer. So, speaking of Woody, 1315 today. Not good for him. Brian Fay, not good for him. Robert, is there any bigger lock to run well at the BU meet than Sam Atkin? That guy always shows up at BU. He doesn't have a great track record of finishing other big races, but BU, he's always in shape and always delivers. 12.58 in the second heat. I mean, but, I mean there's like, wow. I mean, we need to... One thing for next week's week that was, it's like go by, see what these guys run, see see what their previous PBs were. I mean, there was this like I think he's Belgium, John Heyman's up there. It's like who's this guy? Thirteen oh three. I think he'd run like thirteen fourteen before, maybe thirteen eleven. We haven't mentioned Morgan Beetlescum. He got the standards for the U.S. I mean, that's a really good run for him. I mean, for most of these guys, if you get the standard, that's a win. Like Abdelhamid Noor, did he? I, you know, I'm sure he would have liked to be a little higher and it sounds like his training, um, you know, this, this wasn't like a massive result. I think it just wasn't quite as good as, uh, it was lost. Some of he won USA's, but it, it's fine. It's like for him, the standard, that's the number one goal, get the Olympic standard. And now you can focus about peaking for the trials. And that's why for someone like Joe Klecker, it's got to be frustrating because, Maybe he just decides, hey, I'm going to put my all, all my eggs in the five in the 10K like he did in 2021, and he made that team. He always makes the 10K team. But if he does want to try to double uh, in the 5K and 10K, you know, now you're going to have to find another race to run at 13.05, and that's going to, you know, you have to fit that into your schedule. So it can be a bit of, pain, of a pain in the butt for some of these guys, whereas the ones that got the standard, they're like, good, did my job, and I'll make sure I'm at my best, you know, later in the summer. Intern Alex is on the chat. He says, does this mean all the shoe companies have caught up to Nike with super spikes? Under Armour and Hoka win with on Adidas Puma up there too. It's a good point because, yeah, right? I mean, Under Armour and uh, Hoka won. Hoka was a brand. People were leaving Hoka before the last Olympic trials because – they weren't convinced they could compete on a level playing field in their spikes. So for them to now have a guy ranked 1256, yes, that's a it's a great sign for them. Who left Hoka, John? Didn't Rachel Smith leave Hoka and uh, run for Under Armour and made the Olympic team with Under Armour? That's what I was thinking, actually. So I don't that's think the spikes thinking. make as much of a deal as the super shoes down the road. And I think in both areas, other companies are catching up, which is w what we want. We want an even playing field. This, it, the sport of running, it's not Formula One. 
it shouldn't matter what shoe you have on your foot. You know, if you want to support a brand and brand awareness and this other stuff, but like, I don't want it to be influencing who wins the race by who, who they're sponsored by. That That's not what, why we all run as kids. We run, we run as kids to see who's the fastest, who's the best to push ourselves more. And I don't, I, I don't know exactly who spikes better or who responds to better, but it feels like pretty much every, like you could tell when you're talking to athletes four years ago, or five years ago, when this thing's starting to happen, you would talk to them about their spike. They're like, Oh yeah, they, they say they're working on it. And you know, it's going to be really good, but you could kind of tell some people weren't as confident in their equipment. I don't get that sense much anymore talking to athletes like about i don't get the sense there are that many who are worried oh my tech my shoes aren't as good as my competitors shoes i don't think that's as big an issue in the sport these days or at least the athletes don't seem to feel that way from my interactions with them all right have you guys talked about right. the mile yet not yet let's uh, let's say let's get there let's wrap this up i think my two biggest disappointments were the two superstars last year. Did you tell me Woody Kincaid and Joe Clacker, neither one will hit the standard? I would be like, terrible races for both of them. That happened. Um, and the other thing, like, you know, Robert Singo, Abdi Nerd, we, we're people were really expecting good things for him. It's sort of crazy, John, because indoors, you can be a full straightaway behind. You're only like five or six seconds. And big picture... Could someone be 10 seconds ahead of where they are now by July? Of course. Like if you're five seconds back in this race, it means nothing. Like you said, get the standard. I'm trying to pull up here. The road to Paris things. I I'm assuming Klecker and those guys, one, they'll get the standard before the 5k. There's a lot of chances. If you want to make the U S team, you better be able to hit to go to the standard. So if, if you're not in shape, you get the standard, you're not going to make the Olympic team anyway. It doesn't really matter, but I assume they'll probably get in on ranking anyway. Wouldn't you? John or probably I, I I don't think the 5k standard was much of an issue on the men's side last year. Or actually, maybe did McGord I think McGordy got no McGordy had to get it afterwards, but yeah, they'll they'll probably get in on ranking, but it's just it is yeah, I think they, they wanted to do it. The the interesting thing also, I talked to Ritzenhain afterwards and I was like, you know, what'd you guys what'd you make of that performance? And he wasn't, you know, he wasn't overly thrilled, but he his basic thing was like, look we started our training a little bit later than we did uh, for the winter of 2023. He said this time, you know, this, the season ran later last year, the world championships were in the middle of July. The diamond league final was a little earlier this year. The diamond league final was a little later. The worlds were later. He just said they were about four weeks behind where they were this time last year that they had been training for more time. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't super concerned about that. He was just like, you know, we 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 didn't have those four extra weeks of workouts under our belts, and that's probably why we didn't run, or at least you know some of their guys didn't run quite as well tonight as they did uh, this meet last year. I'm looking at the road to Paris list. I guess you have to have so many performances in the window because Olin Hacker has to would get in on the quota. Like what? I don't see. Kim Cade or Klecker on the list. So yeah, I think you need th at least three performances in the window, right? And the window only started like last the middle of last summer or something like that. All right, let's turn to people are asking about the women's races, John. Those are tomorrow, correct? Uh, unless you want to break down the women's DMR, which I don't think had any interest had good schools in it. So yeah, the women's races are all tomorrow night. Or tomorrow morning. Well, There's an 800. Roisin Willis and Juliet Whitaker are running the 800 at like 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. So not sure if I'll be there for that. But yeah, they're all tomorrow. Sexism never stops. But there was a race. I don't know what time this race was. It's fairly early in the afternoon. I believe it went super hot on Let's Run.com. Featured Colin Salmon. Salmon. Craig Ingalls was in there. And with the big win, fist pump. If you're going to win one of these races, celebrate. Thank God. that like uh, Adrian celebrated good when he won the 5K. But this, I think this, this was the, the – well, I didn't see a lot of the races, but this was the celebration of the evening. 
Colin Tomlin gets the win, 353-17. The biggest win of his career, for sure. Unless you count 2021 running lane nationals. Uh, or 2021, was it? I don't think there was NXN that year. Um, it was a big win, though, because he beat some good, like Charles Philippe Tibuto, world championship semifinalist in the 1500 last year. Colin Solomon beat that guy. Uh, and he he came from way back to do it. I don't know if you guys watched this race, but Solomon was like a second and a half back at the bell of CPT, ran him down, had a great last lap, uh, 27-27, 55 second final 400 he looked great and he'd been so interesting he ran 403 at this nau meet last week that converts using the ncw altitude conversion to 354 what did he run today at bu he ran 353 so people complain about oh these altitude conversions generous i think they're fairly accurate uh you know they they're extremes either way but the other interesting thing, he'd been doing some 400s at their home meet. He ran like 49-2 and then 48-9 the last two meets. And he said the reason they did that was to practice being strong in the final 100 meters. You know, he's getting out. He's way behind a lot of these sprinters because he can't sprint like a – he can't start like a sprinter. But as they're kind of dying towards the end, he's trying to stay strong and, and pass them. That's basically what he did in this one. He – took off and his last 100 meters was easily the best in the field and he won it in 353-17 PB great great run by him I was impressed and you know who beat him by almost 6 full seconds last week in the mile Nico Young correct in the same race yes they were so subtract 6 seconds from 353 and you get 347 what's the American record 347 I don't think Young can run 347. I'm not sure he's quite fast enough, but I am concerned. The more I think about that, if Young's not running, this might be peak Nico. Like maybe he was overtraining a little bit and cut and cross. He's he's tapered down and he's running well, but like it's not run? sustainable. Yeah, you can't. I, yeah. He said, I don't need to run. Yes, you do. So who would I rather be right now? Abdi Noor, 100%. Let's say, let's assume Abdi Noor is 100% healthy or Nico Young. Well, even Nebbier was 100% healthy. Who would I rather be? I'd rather be Abdi Noor, but. In terms of making an impact for the Olympics and trials and stuff, but like I, the more I'm thinking about it, like we're getting caught up in, in the short term. This is great for Nico. Nico, go pro right now, right now. Don't ever run again. Go pro right now. Don't risk it. If your knee's bothering you, go pro. Like you peak right now. You know. Yeah, I do, I do think Robert. You know, you can race this. We see this. People go to, and string together a couple of races in a row. Uh, and they won't be doing that much mileage in between. You can do that when you get really super, super fit. But long term, like you're not going to be able to get away without running in between those things and working out. I'm, I know Mike Smith knows that. I'm sure they will figure out a way to, you know, get him back running mileage, get him healthy. They know that's important. But you know, you also there's something to be said for striking with the iron's heart, and they know he's in 1257 sub 13 shape. So. Go ahead, take a crack at sub-13, and he got it. So great run by him. The other thing in this mile race, you guys see who was third place? Craig Engels, 354.03. And he actually closed pretty well. He 27.43. But I didn't talk to Craig afterwards, but I did see one of his highlights. I think he talked to one of the other outlets. I'm not sure if it was Sidious or Flow Track. They all have stringers out there these days. And he was essentially like, Look, I, I got to be winning this kind of race. You know, if I'm going to be beating Yard Nagoose or Hobbs Kessler or, you know, Cole Hawker and getting on that Olympic team, I need to be beating people like Charles Philip uh, Thibodeau or Colin Solomon. Uh, and I know, you know, he's on a little different timeline. He's not getting ready for NCAAs, but he's right. If he wants to make the Olympic team, these are the kind of races he needs to be winning. And he didn't do it. So he's still got some work to do. Yeah, when I saw the results, I was like, wow, I wonder what Craig Ingalls is thinking right now. Because at one point, I mean, what, it was 2016? He was a young gun. You know, he was the sort of Colin Solomon. Wait, wait can we give a shout-out to Matt Clams? Amazing comment on YouTube. Nico Young might be like the week six Miami Dolphins. It's a little harsh because I'm really excited for Nico. And then all of a sudden I got negative because I'm just like, this might be Pete Nico. 
But like, I feel like this is a guy that it is hard being the high school star. He's the OG at, at Newberry Park, dude. He put them on the map, and then all the other kids followed. And it's just incredible the talent they have, and, and the job that Sean did with them. But then it, it's like, you know, in the fall, even though his finish was worse, he was telling us he's a better runner than he ever was. And I was just so impressed that he was focus on the process and the fact that he wasn't winning wasn't that big of a deal. So, congrats to him. Daniel Black has a comment. Ingles is back, baby. Post kid, he's a kid. Is that true? This is news to me. I know. I also, know what do you mean post kid? It's not like he gave birth. Like if you, I, I don't think he has a kid that I'm aware of. Maybe he does, but if you do, it's not like oh, baby's here now. I can sleep. It's like no, you're still not sleeping for another two years or three years. So. Now, now, my father-in-law yeah. has a, a massive. Um, I, I know I know his high school coach. I can text. I don't I, mean, I, I didn't know of any children or anything, but maybe if it is, it's a great sign for him because another there's the whole Robert Johnson. If you're not a regular listener, one of my runners, me and Cornell, we, it was only for Cornell runners, but a man in a relationship did not run well. A, a man on the prowl ran well, a woman in a relationship ran great. So the man was dating a girl, and it was going well, amazing. But once they got settled, it was the opposite for the women. But my father-in-law has a, a corollary of this. It's kind of the opposite, though. Once, particularly in baseball, once a guy has a kid, he's like, they're going to have a massive year. They're focused. They got to. They got to put food on the table. So, there you have it, folks. Not sure if it applies to running, but it does apply to baseball. According no, to I'm not sure it applies to Craig Engels right now either. Daniel is furiously backtracking in the comment section. So I, I don't think Craig Engels recently had a kid, but uh, you know. Maybe that's something I'm sure he would take that it in good spirits if he did not. Uh, Craig isn't one that really freaks out about stuff. I mean, well, I'm not judging, but Craig isn't the first runner I would expect to like, you know, get married, settle down and have a kid. But I said that about a friend of college and he was the first guy I knew to get married and have a kid. So it's well, now it's, speaking of Craig, it's, 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 we don't think kid has any Craig has any kids, but. He's coached by his college coach, Van Hoy, out in California. And it hit me. I have an epiphany. This guy has got a coach. And he's friends with Donovan Brazier. Donovan Brazier, right now, if you're listening to the show, get on a plane, pack your bags, whatever. Van Hoy needs to coach you for the Olympic year. Like, Robert, like, haven't you already had this epiphany? Someone's already suggested it to me, and it makes perfect sense to me. I think Van Hoy's a great mid-distance coach. He, well, I suggested to you, but I don't know if I publicly said it. So okay, now it's well, it's I, I will endorse that idea because Donovan Brazier doesn't have a coach right now. He needs to get healthy first and foremost, but he has a great relationship with Craig Engels. San Luis Obispo sounds like an awesome place to train, uh, and Van Hoy's a good coach. I makes perfect sense to me. I gotta go. I got a football game to get ready for, guys. We're over an hour. The football football game. The football game's not till Sunday. I have Brighton versus Sheffield United FA Cup semi final. Sorry, not semi final. We made the semi finals last year. FA Cup fourth round, ten a.m. Like my game's tomorrow. Your game is Sunday afternoon. Me and my wife's in Singapore for a week. Family, it's sexism. Just they're acting like, oh, do you need help? How are you doing? I can do whatever the hell I want with the kids all weekend. I, I don't need any help. But now someone's Wait. going to babysit for four hours tomorrow. All sorts of stuff. No, I was. I think it's a fair question. Two kids under the age of four, and you're by yourself for a week. Well, then that's that is like not. That's not simple, right? Dur or are you just a great a week, dad that I, I have, No, during the but not for a weekend, hanging out with two kids. And I don't have to. I don't have to like worry about anyone else in the house. I mean, I love my wife dearly, but it, it, kind of easy for one weekend. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about. I mean, Crystal Palace worrying about them in the FA Cup because they're not in it anymore, so they don't have a game. I had to get that thing in there. All right. Oh, the one other thing I was. I will say we had two supporters club members come up to me at the meet and ask for selfies, and it was lovely to meet them. One of them said, "Happy early birthday." So. Um, great seeing your faces at the meet in Boston. Hope you guys enjoyed the races tonight. And you thanks guys, for, so much for saying hello. I was hoping they were going to be you gals, or was guys a generic term, John? What's no, well, it, they were all guys, but um, yeah. you know, 
it's you know it's shameful we make john it's 11 o'clock at night in the weekend we make him come record a podcast he should be out there in the boston scene oh speaking of sports club we gotta have a meetup in orlando right actually yeah. a phone call phone call and another supporters club club member told me a place to have it um but now i also realize we're gonna probably have it at five like you know 7 p.m on friday it's like when every bar is packed but we're still working on that, but join today. If you want this as a podcast? There's only one way to get it as a podcast. We may even rip this off YouTube. Sometimes we leave it up, sometimes we don't. Let's run.com slash subscribe. All our supporters club members, we appreciate it. We've also have um podcast out with Clayton Young, the number two seed for the Liberty Northern Trials, and Connor Mance, the number one seed. Well, John, we almost made Clayton Young cry. I mean, we made him cheer up on air. So that makes us sound like we're bullies. It was tearing up in an emotional, like wholesome way, not Weldon, you know, calling him names and making him cry. I said, what would it mean to make the Olympic team? And wow. I mean, he was tearing up. I thought I was going to tear up. So we'll have a lot more content this week, getting everyone pumped up for Orlando. All right. Now you guys, you guys are going to be up at 5 a.m. for the uh, Kazakhstan indoor meet right the world indoor tour gold is kicking off with uh, a meet in astana kazakhstan at 5 a.m eastern i'm gonna leave that one in your hands why don't we get, get one of these like have you seen the city looks beautiful astana they, they have this, this big the... structure it looked kind of cool i was like that's, that's why a cool I put it on the thing homepage. right is this one of these countries where there's kind of like a pseudo dictator maybe democracy is overrated folks i, I mean, think of the cool. central asian nations that one's like the most free but it's still not like you know free free but yeah maybe we should just get one of these guys so like hey we'll make the astana gold tour really popular john you can go live in kazakhstan for a year you know <laughs> work in the palace no well, my um, sister's dad's a beer, big beer drinker apparently i gotta go like uh, the toilet uh, i put it up on lunch one it there's a problem with it I've gotten some advice i was gonna give away a free shirt no one gave me good advice I had to go to Ace Hardware, but I have the the equipment, so I'm gonna try to do it. Oh, I'm warning here because that Kazakhstan is not a dictatorship, and Womp people Womplified says to... that's great hiking out in Kazakhstan. So uh, next time I'm out there, I, I'll uh, check it out. For some reason, Robert's been comp compared to Marge Shot. I'm not sure why. And oh. I asked John before the podcast started, he said, you got a new background. Where are you? And I asked John, I'm like, do you know who Dick Morris is? And he said, no. Uh, Dick Morris was like Bill Clinton's like, you know, political guru guy, kind of the, you know, the, what is it? Everybody has one, like the Karl Rove of, for Bill Clinton helped yeah. him elected. Um, it's funny because I had to Google this stuff after what happened this week. So this week he was on a podcast or something and a man walks out uh, in, his in his boxers, just through the back of the screen you know, kind of comes through a door like back there and just sort of walks <laughs> dick doesn't say anything um dick was also like i think he had to resign he was involved with a call girl or prostitute or something during the clinton thing so clearly okay, we're way off the rails, rails here i still have to write finish this recap so let's end this thing uh, i don't know how we got to talk about dick There's, morris you have a door open behind you okay that's why no so one, no one's in my house so Okay. All right, guys. Talk to you all Tuesday.